Good evening. I'm Liz Schaefer, Food for Thought Program Coordinator. Tonight, we welcome two audiences, you right here in person at the Whaling Museum and our virtual audience via Zoom across the country. I'm also delighted to welcome members of Nantucket's Youth Climate Committee for presenting tonight's program. The Nantucket Youth Climate Committee was created in partnership with Mass Audubon's Youth Climate Leadership Program in 2020 and is comprised of local high school students who care deeply about the future of our island community, our rising tides, and our eroding shores. The students will share their thoughts and perspectives on the climate crisis and explore how they expect issues of climate change will go on to impact their future lives and careers. This morning at the International Women's Breakfast, I heard an interesting phrase, climate change is delicious. Not scary, not negative, but delicious as an opportunity for us to be mindful and creative as we decide and discover how we want to sustain ourselves. As you listen to these engaging presentations, I invite you to think about what each of us can do to contribute to the conversation as we move toward a sustainable community. As always, there will be a Q&A at the end. And now I'm going to introduce Sarah Swenson, the Nantucket Youth Climate Committee President. Um, welcome everyone, we're the Youth Climate Committee. Um, my name is Sarah Swenson, I'm a junior in high school. I've been passionate about climate change and conservationism since I was young. And I joined this program in the spring of 2020 because of that passion. We've grown a lot since our four person start. This isn't the whole Youth Climate Committee. Um, and I'm so happy to be presenting to all of you today and to be introducing this wonderful group. The YCC has put together these slideshows to share the youth perspective on climate change and talk about how it will affect our futures. Climate change is a threat to all of humanity and who better to take on that threat than the very generation that it will affect most. First present is Ellie Kinsella. She'll be talking about the chemistry of climate change. Hi everybody, thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm just gonna pull up my presentation really quick for you guys to see. Okay, so as Sarah said, my name is Ellie. I am 16 years old, a junior at Nantucket High, and I also just so happen to be the vice president of the Nantucket Youth Climate Committee. Um, I have a really big interest in chemistry. From the first chemistry class I took, I was sold on the subject, and now I want to major in it in college, and the, um, the hope is to have a career that has something to do with chemistry in the future. I um, am also a firm believer in the fact that people should have a basic understanding of um, climate change in general in order to help um, further their knowledge of the topic and the discussions that they can have with other people. So because of those two things today, we'll be talking to you about the basic chemistry of climate change. So first of all, what is our general overarching issue? It is increased carbon dioxide emissions. Increased carbon dioxide emissions lead to global warming and ocean acidification as two more kind of big broad general topics. Um, global warming, I'm sure you've all heard the term before, it's the general heating and warming of the earth. Um, it can lead to um, the glaciers melting and ice caps melting and um, the increased number of storms we've been seeing and the increased um, storm severity and extremity, as well as the wildfires and droughts that have been kind of ravishing the earth as of um, recent. How you may ask, so it um, really has uh, detrimental effects on the carbon cycle as a whole. The more carbon dioxide we emit, the more is going into the atmosphere and the more is going into the ocean. The ocean holds about 50% more carbon dioxide than the atmosphere does. So if there's a substantial amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, there is a lot in the ocean. So carbon, um, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. A greenhouse gas is classified as a gas that um, absorbs and emits radiant energy on the infrared scale. Infrared energy is hot. So all of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, as well as in the ocean, um, is absorbing this infrared energy from the sun and redistributing it, redistributing it into the rest of the world which warms the earth as well as the ocean. So because um, I feel as though ocean acidification is most prevalent to Nantucket as of right now, I'm gonna be talking about that um, as kind of our main topic. So ocean acidification does not mean that the ocean is acidic. 
um, ocean acidification instead means that the pH of the ocean is slowly decreasing and becoming more acidic. Just in case you're not familiar with the pH scale, we consider seven to be neutral, anything above seven to be basic, and anything below seven to be acidic. The average pH of the ocean right now is about 8.1, so it is basic. I'd like to draw your attention to the chemical equation we have. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with H2O is water and CO2 is carbon dioxide, um, but here's a new one. It's called carbonate. It's CO3 to minus. Now, as humans, it probably doesn't seem like a big deal. It's just one carbon, three oxygens, and a little two minus in the superscript to indicate the charge. Um, so it's not a big deal, right? Wrong. To shell marine organisms, carbonate is essential to basically their lives as a whole. In chemical reactions, generally, when we um, the chemical reaction can go on and on and on and on and on until one of the reactants is gone. Water, carbonate, and carbon dioxide are all the reactants in this equation. Because this equation um, takes place in the ocean, there is an excess of water. And because of the increased carbon dioxide emissions, there is also an excess of carbon dioxide. This means that this reaction will go on and on and on and on as long as there is a, a sufficient amount of carbonate. This means that carbonate is being used up and up and up to make um, two bicarbonate ions, which is our product. Um, and it means that shelled marine organisms do not have a chance to use the carbonate for themselves. So why is carbonate needed? Um, shelled marine organisms use carbonate to make calcium carbonate, which is pretty much the building block for their whole lives. Coral is made completely out of calcium carbonate and oysters, mollusks, lobsters, crabs, they all use um, calcium carbonate in order to make their shells. So I have two pictures up here. One is of coral and the other is of oysters. Now, they're both at a pH of 8.1, which is the average ocean pH right now. They look as we expect them to be. The oysters are, um, they're healthy. They look like a good color. They're the right, correct, they're, they're the correct size. Um, and the coral is as bright and beautiful as we would expect coral to be. Now, here are two more pictures. I'm not entirely sure the pH of the water that the coral is at, but the oysters I know for a fact are at a pH of 7.5. 7.5 is still basic. It is still 0.5 above neutral, but it has been affected by ocean acidification because the pH has gone from 8.1 to 7.5. So the oysters have lost some of their color and they don't look healthy like we would normally expect oysters to look, but the main, my main focus is the coral. Coral bleaching is the act of coral losing its color um, in, um, as it reacts to um, changes in its environment. So as I mentioned before, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and it warms the ocean. So the coral bleaches because of the increasing temperatures because it's um, unnatural in its environment. I like to draw your attention to the smaller kind of corals around the bottom. We call those favocytes. They are, they're also known as honeycomb coral. They are circular coral that normally have very distinct pores all around them. These favocytes look like they've been buffed almost. They look like they've been scraped with a nail file. That is um, the effect of ocean acidification on these coral. Because they cannot make calcium carbonate, they cannot reinforce their um, shells and they start to dissolve and disappear. So how is all this prevalent to act? Well, Nantucket is the last commercial, sustainable, natural, whatever you want to call it, bay scallop fishery in the world. Because of ocean acidification, bay scallops, um, they cannot reinforce or make their shells, so their shells begin to dissolve and disappear, and they die. Now, this might not seem like a big deal to you because maybe you don't like bay scallops, but it really attests to the overall general idea that the world is slowly losing all of its um, natural marine resources due to ocean acidification and general climate change. Um, it also affects Nantucket because yes, Nantucket is largely a tourist-based economy, but we are also a, in part a marine-based economy. And if we lose our last natural resource, that kind of not just affects us, but affects the world as a whole, that is no good for us. So what's the takeaway? Um, increased carbon dioxide emissions means that there's more carbon dioxide in the ocean. This carbon dioxide reacts with water, with water and carbonate and continues to go on and on and on and use up all of the carbonate that it can. This means that shelled marine organisms do not get the chance to use calcium carbonate for themselves to form their shells and reinforce their shells, which means that marine shelled organisms and their ecosystems and humans all suffer. Scallops and oysters and mollusks and clams are all natural nitrogen removers and water filters. If their ecosystems lose them, they lose their nitrogen removers and water filters, which can harm the other organisms that are a part of their ecosystem. And as I said before, some economies 
um, around the world are very based on marine resources. And if we do not have these marine resources, then it can really hurt their economy as a whole, which can in turn hurt the people um, that are a part of the um, economy. <laughs> Okay, that's all. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ellie. Really interesting. And before anybody else speaks, let me just say now how much work I appreciate you put into these uh, presentations. I know the ones coming up as well, but this, this is the first time I've heard Ellie's from beginning to end. And um, you guys are impressive. I can hardly wait to see what's next. Oh, speaking of next, Dylan Marks and Anna Popnikolova Pop uh, will be addressing the community impacts of climate change. Hi, I'm Dylan Marks, and this is um, Anna Popnikolova. And today we'll be talking about climate change in demographics. I'll be covering the global side of things and how climate change affects different communities globally. And, and I'll be talking about how it affects our Nantuck community. So I will be starting us off. And is the screen being shared? Um, so I'll be talking about kind of the more local side of things and the way that climate change affects different communities on Nantucket. Um, so the effects of climate change are correlated with wealth distribution. So the low income communities are affected disproportionately to upper class communities. Um, and this isn't just on Nantucket, this is in the whole world. And these effects come through, you know, flooding, depleted resources, and financial instability from increased cost of living. And that last part um, is kind of what I'll be focusing on the most. So I think it's important to note that on Nantucket, there's a lot of things that are kind of flipped on their head. Um, so on the mainland and the real world, we'll have um, low income communities placed in flood prone areas, and those will be the ones that are damaged, you know, from storms and floods. But in Nantucket, it's the other way around. You see phenomenally expensive coast, um, coastal properties, and those are the ones that um, are the most expensive, and they're susceptible to storm and flood damage. Um, a good example of this was the Toscana move. Some of you might be familiar with it. It was in 2019, and it was a $16 million property, and it had to be moved back, what was it, 80 feet to the north, 60 feet to the east, and it cost the owners um, about $2 million to pick up their house and move it. And we can see people who can afford this on Nantucket, um, the owners of these expensive properties, but people on the mainland can't afford to pick up their houses and move them. They can't afford to accommodate climate change with seawalls and um, other measures. So coastal property as it's damaged and more areas are restricted from you know, building because they're dangerous, um, it becomes more difficult to come by and real estate prices rise. So logically you'd assume that somebody doesn't wanna buy a house that could be underwater within the next decade. Unfortunately, it's actually the other way around. As less coastal property is available, more people want it and it becomes more expensive. It becomes coveted. It becomes like a finite supply to get a little piece of that Nantucket real estate before it's all gone. Um, and we can see the graph I have. Um, it's from Fisher Real Estate and the way that just median single family home prices have just been increasing over the past few years. And some statistics for you. We have the average um, house on Nantucket goes for about $3 million, a little bit more than $3 million. And on one side of that, we have one of the least expensive houses on Nantucket, which was $500,000. It was at Mid-Island. It was a four-bedroom house. And 60 times more than that, we had the Easton Street house. Now, again, some of you might be familiar with the Easton Street property. It was a 1.1 acre waterfront property, beautiful house. And it sold for $32.5 million. Um, and this was a house that was in Bram Point. And again, if any of you have been following even just a little bit of climate action on Nantucket, you'll know that Bram Point is the most at-risk area on the entire island. And to buy a, a $32 million house um, in the most at-risk area on island is personally <laughs> beside me. Um, this was a study about kind of the phenomenon that happens with um, 
waterfront property. This was a study done in Yale by Matthew Spiegel in 2021. And it suggests that coastal property becomes a finite supply and you want it more. And buyers of these expensive houses don't see um, climate change as something that's gonna affect them in the short term. They see climate change as something that's happening 20, 30 years down the road. By then, they might've sold their house. By then, this isn't gonna affect them. And they're buying this property as property prices are rising. And it's a really dangerous way of thinking when you're trying to mitigate the amount of effect that we're having on the climate. Um, and as housing prices go up with waterfront property, it goes up all across the island, obviously, and this increases rent. And everybody knows that on Nantucket, rent is ridiculous. I mean, if you can even find a place to rent in the first place. And this, um, was shown, this graph is from the US census. This is in 2020, so um, 2019. So we can assume that obviously that's increased over the past few years um, and the cost of living increases. And this is um, Nantucket compared to Massachusetts and the United States. So we can see that Nantucket is 38% higher in median gross monthly rent than Massachusetts and 45% higher than the national um, median. This contributes to cost of living. And again, we all know that living on Nantucket is really, really expensive. It is significantly higher than both Boston and statewide averages. This um, graph is from a cost of living calculator. And from some other statistics, the Nantucket data platform did a calculation recently. It showed Nantucket as 21% higher to live in, more expensive to live in than Boston, 32% most, more expensive to live in than Barnstable. And keep in mind that Boston is in the top 1% of expensive cities in the world. So if Boston is one of the most expensive cities to live in in the whole world, and Nantucket is more expensive than that, what are we looking at? Now, we're gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about, um, rather than how we're affected by it, how um, some people contribute to it. We know we have a lot of tourists come in the summer. We are a tourist-based economy and we have a lot of upper-class people coming in the summer. You know, they're, they're summer houses. Most of coastal property is owned by um, people who come here in the summer and don't live here year round. The majority of carbon emissions usually come from transportation. And this is transportation, again, it applies globally, but we're talking about Nantucket. So from the mainland to the island, we've got the um, planes and we've got ferries and we've got people bringing their cars on island, driving their cars around. And again, this emits carbon dioxide and it also increases cost of transportation and makes it really inconvenient to live on Nantucket in the summer and try to get anywhere. I mean, the drive from my house to town is five minutes. In the summer, I think record time was 45 minutes. <laughs> it's, it's really ridiculous to anybody who's been, tried to get anywhere on Nantucket. The streets are very congested with so many vehicles coming. And that's kind of the last bullet here, um, owning and operating multiple cars and bringing those cars onto our island and increasing our island-wide carbon footprint. And again, I think we all love um, walking downtown at night, right in the summertime, and you're walking down the docks and you're looking at the yachts, you know, the sparkly lights. I think that that's an experience that everybody has had before. They're beautiful to look at, but they do contribute to carbon emissions. You know, they use fuel and they're also um, not sustainable for our island. So a lot of the things that more upper class people can afford to have as part of their lifestyle isn't necessarily sustainable. This is a study um, from the University of Leeds and it was done in 2020 and it was published in Nature Energy Journal. And it shows the correlation between income inequality and energy footprint inequality. It basically means the more money you make and spend, the more you contribute to the energy footprint and the higher the personal energy footprint you have. So the graph, yeah, it looks a little complicated. It's got a lot of colors and shapes and all the different things mean different things. But what I want you to look at with that graph is the lines. So the lines on both of those graphs are going up. That indicates a positive correlation. So as exponential goes up, energy footprint goes up and they go up together. And on the left side, we have it says Gini coefficient, and Gini coefficient essentially just means more inequality. So the more inequality there is in energy footprint, the more inequality there is in exponential, and it goes the other way. Um, these are some statistics from the study that I just mentioned. I'm not going to read all of them. Obviously, you can give it a look. Um, 
they really are shocking. And there's a lot to talk about, but I'm going to focus on the first one. So the top 10% consumes 20 times as much vinyl energy as the bottom 10%. And when we think about the statistic, we don't want to think of the top 10% and the bottom 10% as the same amount of people, because it's not. The top 10% is significantly less people than the bottom 10%. And these are people who are impoverished and typically can't afford to be consuming that much energy. And the last statistic, um, inland transport, the bottom 50%, we're not talking 10% anymore, we're talking 50%. Bottom 50% receive a bit more than 10% of the energy used and in air transport, make use of less than five. I'm just gonna let that sit for a second. The bottom 10% use, <laughs> the bottom 50% use 10% of land transport, 5% of air transport. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot that's being used by the top 50% and probably the top 10%. And something interesting recently when we're talking about air travel was the Boeing CEO, I think last year in like an interview, said that their airline company has so much potential because 80% of the world's population has never been on an airplane. So 20% of the world's population has been on an airplane probably multiple times and can't afford to buy that plane ticket, go on that vacation, but the rest of the world can't and they're not contributing to those air transport emissions because they can't afford it. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of go over the three main things that I talked about, increased real estate prices due to sea level rise. This is specifically on Nantucket, you know, are correlated with increased cost of living. The wealthier visitors on island over the summer emit disproportionately high amounts of carbon as compared to the local residents and middle to lower class families on Nantucket. And not just locally, but globally, low-income communities contribute less to climate change and are affected by it more. Um, I'm going to hand the presentation off to my friend Dylan, and he's going to talk to you a little bit more about the global side of things. Thank you so much. So as Anna said, basically the situation here on Nantucket is a bit flipped when it comes to how people are affected. Wealthier families seem to be more affected by climate change here than lower-income families. But however, that's not the case globally. Overall, lower income families are drastically more affected by climate change than anyone else in the world. Devastation across all communities. All over the world, communities depend on their natural resources to, for livelihoods, to make a living. This counts for forests, lakes, and oceans, all of which are being destroyed or altered by climate change, whether it be increased droughts, which lead to forest fires, or as Ellie said earlier, ocean acidification, which completely devastates coastal communities that use ecotourism or fishing. This means that those lower income families, however, don't have the same support that they would otherwise because their livelihoods are completely affected. Um, world Vision states that around 75% of the world's lower income families in rural areas depend on natural resources, which is huge. This means basically that they won't be able to afford the same protections as wealthier families would, and they might not be able to sustain living in those areas. This also has a major effect on coastal communities. Coastal cities tend to have a higher population density than anywhere else. The uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Agency reports that population density is over five times greater in coastal shoreline counties in the US than anywhere else inland in the US. This means that large proportions of Americans, and I'm assuming everywhere else in the world that has coastal communities, are greaterly affected by climate change. Coastal towns face flooding, and they also have reduced fish populations, which means increased competition worldwide. This means that if these, local, if these communities cannot sustain fishing or their ecotourism, they basically won't be able to stay in these coastal communities anymore, and they might have to relocate. Fishing communities around the world could collapse. Um, one study is from the uh, North Carolina fish stock restatus, as you can see, as the years go on, the fish stock declines. It might be due to unsustainable fishing, but it also could be because of, it's amplified by climate change. Many coastal towns and cities depend on fishing for income. If you take a collective of all the coastal counties in the country and you basically make them their own sovereign state, they have the world's, the world's third most highest gross domestic product, which means that we depend on them a lot to regulate our economy. 
which says even a lot more for those people that depend on fishing in general for survival. The grave impacts. This poses huge threats to families that are dependent on these sources of income. They may not be able to sustain their living, and they also are threatened to move, which puts them in a tight situation because if you are receiving a lower and lower income and you are being forced out of an area and housing is increasing because housing is becoming more and more unavailable, you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place because you can't essentially afford to move, but you need to move. Forced relocation is part of that issue. Um, a great example of this, unfortunately, is um, this picture that was taken from Afghanistan demonstrating the devastation going on from a basically an amplified drought from climate change. More than six people have been pushed to the brink of financial instability, and 100,000 people have been forced to move into makeshift camps in order just to find work out of sides of cities. However, this has pretty big implications because wealthy families don't usually experience this because they have the money to support them. They have the protections, they have insurance, and basically they can afford to move. Future generations are also threatened by this. Um, youths are affected because they lose out on education and they also are forced to work and support their families that are struggling at the moment. According to the International Labor Organization, children are most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Children are 10 times more likely to defy, die before the age of five in underdeveloped countries compared to developed ones. Also, I believe 180 million children under the age of 18 have been forced into some form of labor in order to help support their families. The takeaways from this are that basically climate change affects us all, and some of us a little bit more than others. It leads to financial instability, and around 100 million more people could be pushed into poverty without direct action. That's around 7,000 Nantuckets, if you need that comparison. It's a lot of people. Climate change affects us all, and it's important to realize that because at the end of the day, even though we all might be affected differently and some of us can deal with the effects, long term, if we don't do anything about it, we're all not going to be able to see the next day. Anyway, thank you for listening. I've been Dylan Marks, and this has been my presentation on the effects that climate change has on the globe. I'll be passing it back off to Liz. I don't know how much more I can absorb. It's a lot to think about, but I'm ready. So our final presenters are Sarah Swenson and Taylor Bistani speaking on the effects climate change can have on one's mental health. So, so um, we're going to be talking about the effects of climate change on mental health. Um, this is a topic that I'm especially passionate about because my interest thing that I hope to do in my life is psychology. I hope to be working in the mental health field and helping people with that. And one of the big things that affected my mental health and people that I know as mental health is climate change. So Taylor's going to get us started. Before we start, I want to think about the topics that we've been discussing and how they make you feel. Think about the floods washing away miles of coastline, the burning fires that burn down forests, the storms, the droughts. I think the conclusion you all come to is pretty much the same across the board. You feel bad, scared, angry, sad, powerless, nervous perhaps. Recently, the New York Times published an article about negative feelings caused by climate change. These the name for this is called climate anxiety. And it is a very real problem, especially for the people of our generation. Climate anxiety is a pervasive and constant feeling of stress relating to the climate crisis. It is considered a psychological condition, though not a diagnosis, but it is recognized by therapists, including the APA. In fact, a study by the APA found that 67% of Americans are somewhat or extremely anxious about the impacts of climate anxiety on their planet. And 55% of Americans are extremely or somewhat anxious about climate, the climate change and the effect of that on their mental health. 
that is over half the population of the United States. And those rates are even higher when we look at teens, our generation, as we will later. The horrible thing about climate anxiety is that the more you learn, the worse it gets. If you're turned into climate change and you care, you're going to feel the negative effects of it on your mental health. This stress is long-term. It's not a one and done fear like you would get about a mishap at work or school. We can refer to this as chronic stress. Chronic stress is defined as a constant sense of feeling pressured, anxious, and or overwhelmed over a long period of time. Chronic stress can result from many things. Maybe you're renting and you are uncertain about your housing situation on month on month. For Sarah and I, this is school. School is a constant thing day after day, week after week for years of our lives. You can probably feel this possibly at work or school. You guys are at home. Um, kids and teenagers, as we've been saying, um, feel the effects of climate change even more acutely than adults might. Um, and this is, let's get the slide, we'll get there. Um, so what does this chronic stress do to you? Chronic stress, even when it's in low levels, like stuff that you might think is just background noise, can have extremely detriment detrimental impacts on your mental health. Um, it exacerbates symptoms of mental illness, such as depression and anxiety. It puts you at increased risk, risk for cardiovascular problems, um, such as heart attack, stroke, um, high blood pressure, abnormal heart rhythms. It also has other physical effects, such as um, it can cause digestive problems, headaches, muscle tension, and pain. And these symptoms might have an unexpected longevity. So even once you get rid of the immediate stress, you could still be feeling the effects. It also weakens our immune system, which especially right now with COVID, everyone's got their masks on. This is something that we have to be worried about. Um, and kids and teens um, feel the effects of climate change even more acutely than adults. This is because um, we're the ones who are going to have to be here living past some of the deadlines that you see. One of the deadlines that we see a lot is 2050. So you might hear, oh, if we let this keep going and we don't stop before 2050, um, climate change will be irreversible. And I think sometimes people think that's not too bad. I mean, like I've already lived for a while and it's 28 years away, but for us, it's really not that far away. And um, in 2050, I will be only 45, Taylor will be 43. We'll have a lot of life left to live, so we're gonna have to watch the world as it's destroyed. Um, a study done by Nature Magazine with 10,000 kids, teenagers um, from countries across Europe, found that 45% of teenagers say that their feelings about climate change impact their daily lives. That's nearly half of all kids, and I would definitely be one of them. So if you remember the, the numbers from earlier, 67% of adults feel um, extremely or slightly worried about climate change. This study found that 95% of teenagers feel the same way. The teenagers in the study also offered up, offered up some words to describe how uh, climate change makes them feel. Sad, afraid, anxious, angry, powerless, guilty. 51%, um, which is over half of teenagers, feel guilty about climate change. With all of this weighing on our minds, how are we supposed to think about our careers? or our personal futures. Climate change sets up kids to not succeed. It genuinely affects my mental health to think about my world or the next generation's world um, becoming uninhabitable to humans or at least to large swaths of humans as Anna and Dylan talked about in their presentation. So this is a bit more personal to me, but the experiences that we have in our teenage years and into our twenties are formative to our personalities and for me, I know that one of those experiences and the topics that's gonna to help form who I am is climate change. Um, these are just some images that's why I talk about this. Um, so some people grew up during a world war. Some people can remember the 9-11 attacks and the war on terror declared by Bush. Some people can remember the quiet fear of the Cold War or the controversy of the war on drugs. For kids in our generation, our war is the war against climate change. This is the thing that we fear the most. Public discourse focuses on it. Everywhere around us, we see its effects. Do you see how many people in these images are children? California is burning. Shorelines are receding. Entire cities are flooded in storms that become more and more prevalent. I mean, 
just look at the headlines and it's hard to see those and not feel overwhelmed. I mean, how can you look at those and expect us to not panic, to not feel overwhelmed and terrified and honestly angry? Um, there's one thing that you can see in the slides that I've looked through as I've been talking about this, and that is that children, when shown the reality of climate change, choose to act. And so can you, and so should you. It's the only way that things are going to get better, and it's the only way that you can be conscientious and still cope with these feelings. So we've been talking about chronic stress, climate anxiety. Great, but how do we deal with that? Well, you can deal with the same way you deal with or cope with any other anxiety. Take some time to talk about what's been stressing you out. Take some time for yourself, self-care perhaps. Go for a walk in nature and enjoy nature and consider why you love it, not just the fear you have on losing it. But a better solution and one that helps you and the planet is resolving those feelings of powerlessness through action. So we're gonna brainstorm some ideas together so how you can help the planet. There and I will get you started. Um, if you're a student, you can join the NYCC. If you're an adult, you can follow us on Instagram, which is at Nantucket Youth Climate Committee, um, where you can stay up to date on all of our events and you can hear the student perspective or join us in community service, like our contribution to the climate team, sorry, clean team, or join the clean team during the summer season. If you're gonna join us, you can meet us at the milestone face milestone um, on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. Or the regular clean team, which is the Handlebar Cafe at the rooting location, and you're gonna change weekly. So your turn. So um, we're just together. We're gonna brainstorm ideas that you can do um, in your life to help fight against climate change. So if you're attending virtually, you can type into the Q&A. Um, suggestions. And if you're here in person, you can just raise your hand and this will come with a microphone. Well, I'm going to start it off and I'm going to use other than Tom never. So, you know, riding my bike to town to work is not really going to work for me, but I will pledge to ride the wave more often. Hey, great job, guys. Um, something I do in my personal life is I try to buy all thrifted clothes. So I think, like you mentioned, this is really something that's greater than a lot of us, but that's one thing that makes me feel good. I have a uh, suggestion from the Q&A here. Um, we have an anonymous attendee who said you can start your own veggie garden, which is a great idea. Very great. Local and sustainable. Um, I know one way I try and decrease my carbon footprint is by cutting out all red meat and really trying to decrease um, my dairy intake um, to try and decrease methane emissions. I've got another one from the chat here. Um, somebody said instead of uh, driving to the beach, um, trying to ride your bike or walk. Um, so these are all great suggestions. Thank you for participating in this part. Um, the next part that we're going to do is we're going to have everybody who's presented so far come up on stage and, um, it's still going to be interactive. So we're just going to do the Q and a portion now. Um, if you have questions for us, you can type them into the Q and a, and if you're in person, you can raise your hand and one of us will do our best to answer. <laughs> All right, we already have a few great questions for you all. Um, so I'm gonna start with the first um, from Kristen, um, which asks, um, and this is a question to all of you, so perhaps you can each answer individually. Uh, 
asking, could you share an experience um, that inspired you to get involved with climate action? I can start um, because I have one that I kind of talk about to people, um, which is in, I think, fifth grade at um, my middle school. We were shown the TED Talk that uh, Greta Thunberg did. And I remember watching that and hearing her talk about like how black and white this seems to her and, and how if this really is a threat that's like going to kill us, if this is as much of a threat as the scientists who know the most about this say that it is, like why aren't we doing something? Why isn't it a global emergency? Like why aren't we panicking about this the way that we have kind of about COVID? And I just like didn't think about it that way until then. But when she said that, it was like, oh my God. And then it felt really urgent. And that's kind of when all of this kicked off for me. Um, hi. So, um, well, so my aunt has always played a big role in my life. She is actually a little closer to my age than a lot of my other ones. And really she's just out of college and she's starting to teach a course. And she's always just taught me about climate change and she's just told me about it. And that really made me want to learn more about it. And then seeing the walkout that these guys did, um, that made me join this amazing club. So, yeah. Hi, so I actually remember right after the walkout, Taylor came up to me and went, how do I join? <laughs> um, for me, I remember, I think I was young, like third or fourth grade. And I remember those really stupid thumbnails for like ads and, and scams that you should not press. But it was like, if you don't, do this, the world's gonna like go underwater. And it was a picture of the Statue of Liberty and she was like up to her waist in water. And the rest of New York City was just like flooded. And I was like, oh my goodness. And obviously I don't think that's really realistic. And I don't think that's how it works. But I remember being so upset by that and being like, I can't even swim. And <laughs> every time we do something like this, I just think about the Statue of Liberty all flooded. And I, 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 again, I know that that's not necessarily realistic, but it's the first image that comes to mind. And when I found out about the group, I was like, maybe the Statue of Liberty won't drown. So <laughs> um, here I am. Um, I personally enjoy going into nature a lot. I go on a lot of walks, but I think what sparked it for me to actually start acting was um, my junior class's um, environmental science teacher, Ms. Arisman, who really um, just teaches a great class and really got me inspired to act. Um, my dad caretakes a lot of properties all around the island in various different spots. And I remember um, during one big storm, um, one of the properties got completely flooded. And because it was also winter, the next morning it completely froze over. And it flooded because of the rising sea levels and um, erosion around the island. And that kind of sparked my interest in wanting to be um, more active within this cause because I feel like it's um, a very prevalent issue and I want to do something about it if I can. Great, thank you everyone. Um, we've got a few more questions here. Uh, so we're gonna keep going. Um, from Claire, this is directed towards Sarah. Uh, you ended your slides with how young kids can act. In what ways do you hope young people will act? Can you talk about your hopes for the future? Um, well, one of the easiest things that a young person can do to act is to talk to their parents about climate change, because oftentimes kids are more on board with the idea and they're more willing to accept that this is a human caused problem. Um, and as a child and as a somebody's child, you have a really, you have a lot of power there and you have the ability to convince your parents and talk to them in a way that maybe another adult wouldn't be able to. Um, so there's that and talking to your friends, of course. Um, but outside of that, there's just thing, things that everyone can do, which is try to your best to recycle. And if you don't know where to put something, ask somebody. Um, and, you know, do your best to carpool, take the bus, ride your bike, all kind of stuff like that. Great, thank you. Um, as the next question from Will, uh, and this again can be addressed at, at all of you. Um, he says, many heartfelt thanks to the YCC for a wonderful presentation. 
And then how do you all feel about climate resilience on Nantucket and the island's coastal resilience plan? Hi. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about the climate cafe that we hosted a little while back. And it was actually about the coastal resiliency plan. We had speakers come in and they kind of simplified it a little bit and talked about kind of the most important parts. And I think to see something that's actually going to help. I mean, we do a lot of, we do a lot of stuff. We talk about it a lot. I just have a hard time sometimes looking at things that are actually going to change something. I and mean, when we look at the plan and we look at the things that they're going to implement, it's actually doing something. We're not just talking about it. We're putting things down and it's going to happen. And I think it's, it's really cool to think about that we can actually help, you know, um, and it's just really um, inspiring for me to think about it. Great. Thank you, Anna. Um, as I'd say we have time for two more questions. So the next one um, I have from Maddie is, do you think growing up on Nantucket has made you more aware of the climate crisis? And I'll say that's for whoever wants to answer. Um, I mean, really for me, it's just knowing the fact that when I'm an adult and I possibly have children, I might not be able to bring my kids back on the island because it might be underwater. And that really hurts actually, because like I went to see my parents like where they grew up. I got to see their hometowns and to think about that I might never get to do that, that, that kind of changes my perspective on it a lot. Um, one of the things that I think every like kid, teenager on Nantucket um, has experienced and kind of has to think about is all of the places that we have, like the Nantucket's very centered around the town. Um, and when you get downtown, you can walk anywhere, but we see it getting flooded like more and more. And it's kind of scary to think of the place where you have all these like really fun, happy, good memories, like going to the bookstore or getting ice cream at the juice bar. And then like, Every time there's like a storm, everything's flooded and you could like paddle a paddle boat down Main Street and stuff. And like that's right now. And then in like 30 years or something, it's going to be even worse. So I think that growing up in Nantucket has made us more aware because the places that we go to like every day are threatened by just having a storm. Great. Thank you. Um, and for our last question. Uh, it would be great if you all could comment again, as you did to the first question. Uh, could you share with the audience something that makes you excited or hopeful for the future on Nantucket? Okay, um, so at the high school right now, there is um, a big um, talk about um, installing turf fields uh, to help our athletes. But um, I know that a lot of students and um, members of the faculty are against turf fields because of the concerns with PFAS. And um, that makes me really excited because um, it makes me happy to know that it's not just the Youth Climate Committee that is focused on this issue and trying to help slow down the effects of climate change, but it's really the school as a whole. And we all don't want this because we all know the negative effects that it has on people and um, just our livelihood and livelihoods in general. And I, um, that's really exciting to me because I'm really glad it's, that it's not just us. I think that one thing that makes me hopeful for Nantucket's future is just being able to host meetings like this, having bringing in speakers, talking about how we're gonna save the environment, bringing people together and just notifying them what's happening and how they can make a difference. And I think that's what matters in the end and that's what really makes me hopeful. So thank you for hosting us. I don't have anything prepared, but <laughs> I do want to add to what Ellie said about the PFAS um, and the turf fields, because that was something that I'm really involved in and I'm researching it a lot and I'm thinking about it a lot because it's really important to me. And I think 
recently, um, it was actually released that the plan would be continuing tentatively without the turf fields. And to see that email come out, I think it was the Nantucket Current headline. I was like, oh my God, we did it. Because, I mean, I wrote, I think, two editorials. I talked to people about it. I went to the, the meetings. I listened to so many people and I talked about it so much. And to see that it finally actually got to the committee and they considered it and that it, we, we might have done it, <laughs> you know, it was just really good to see and to think that with action and if you put your mind to it and you actually do something, it might work. <laughs> Um, really just the fact that you guys are here virtually or just here to know that just it's not just us, not just our community club. It's knowing that there's more people who actually care and that hopefully they're going to try to change whatever we can the best that we can do. Um, I think this is a sentiment that everyone's kind of shared already um, to some extent, but getting involved, like starting to actually do things in working in climate activism has made me more hopeful, even though I've, I've been exposed to like, I've learned more, so there's more to be scared of. There's also meeting all of the other people who are also trying to do something, um, like meeting with Tobias Glidden about solar panels and energy and meeting with, I don't know, <laughs> Delaney Reynolds about like, I mean, about like rising sea levels and stuff and reading with, all these different people and Sam and um, Ms. Erisman and stuff, it makes you feel better because you're like, I'm not the only person who's really worried about this. Um, even at the beginning of the year, we did the walkout, the, we did a walkout to raise awareness for climate change. The amount of students who left the school and who walked out with us was really inspiring. And also the fact that we were like allowed to do that and it wasn't, we weren't, nobody tried to like stop us from doing that. There wasn't anyone in the way saying, well, climate change is real. Um, that everybody else was understood where we were coming from and why we were concerned.